Hello, welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage here at VMware Explore 2023. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, and we have a special presentation here uh, instead of our normal CUBE segment. We're going to do a panel, round table, rapid fire discussion uh, with Kindrel, Microsoft, Oracle, and VMware all bringing it together really on a topic, and we're going to unpack it here in real time. And modernizing in a digital first multi-cloud world is the topic. This is the hottest topic as we call it super cloud. As architectures start to change, the world is now looking at new ways to set the table, set the infrastructure and the software stacks to power modern applications. This next gen cloud is here. They have ecosystems, they have large language foundation models. The entire computing paradigm is changing and growing every day thanks to the benefits of cloud and AI, all goodness. Exciting to have Sunil Bagarva, Senior Vice President of Offerings at Kindrel, Monte Bhatia, Vice President of Global Systems at VMware, Andrew Bow, VP of Product Development Azure of Microsoft, and Ross Brown, Senior VP, North America Cloud Ecosystem Partners at Oracle. We have a quorum of awesome experts here who are going to debate and talk about the topics and educate you about what's going on in the cloud world. As you got to figure it out, navigating through is going to be challenging with this huge opportunities at the end of the day. There's so much value being created and trans transferred over from old to new, and we're all here. Gentlemen, thank you for Absolutely. Making history in the cube. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Great you to be here. Great to be here. <laughs> so I don't know where to start. We'll start with Kindrel. Uh, you guys set the table for the customers. You guys build out solutions. You've been doing it for a long time. VMware has been partner friendly in bringing the a unique combination of traversing multiple environments on premise. You guys love the on premise environment and edge. We got the cloud for us, Azure, number two and growing fast. I mean, the growth rates are phenomenal. Oracle, the performance and growth of your cloud has really been amazing in the past few years, well, well noted. We're all together. At the end of the day, the customer's sitting there going, okay, I have a lot of cloud, <laughs> and, and, and how'd we get here? Okay, I use Microsoft for this, I got to use Amazon for that, I got Oracle for that, I got VMware for that. I just got to make it run. I think, I'm going to have multiple clouds. <laughs> I think for us where we start is we really have to start with a customer-centric point of view. Um, whether it's through acquisition and nurture, whether it's different departments within the customer, they've, they've ended up with a multi-cloud scenario and now they have to understand how do they take all this data, all these applications and modernize them, whether they modernize in place, whether they leverage different SaaS applications and then how are they going to overlay AI on top of that with all this data to feel that generative model and really see the benefits and the wins and the business value from it and I think that's what's from an Azure standpoint, or from VMware, or from Kindra, or from Oracle, it's a great big world for all of us right now, and I think we all have a unique opportunity to bring a lot of value to customers. Absolutely, and I, John, as you mentioned, you know, this is a typical definition of what we call as the cloud chaos, right? <laughs> this is exactly what cloud chaos is. Uh, you know, I remember last year, Raghu went on the keynote and talked about the cloud chaos, and that's what our cloud smart approach is about, right? Where are the right workloads and which cloud they belong to and how do we get them there is the cloud smart approach. And I think we're all in this boat together to bring our customers to that endpoint, basically. I think opportunity is exactly the right word. Yep. Multi-cloud presents an opportunity. Now, there is an opportunity cost for not leveraging what is available from all the great partners that are available to bring new technologies, and all of you are investing in new capabilities, whether it is for generative AI, security, data analytics, new capabilities coming out all the time. The value Kindrel brings to our customers is being able to help understand for their needs and their challenges, what are the right combination of technologies that can deploy the applications on multi-cloud, on the super cloud, ensuring that they get the best of all the investments that our partners are making. I think you're bringing up a really key point about being able to solve for multi-cloud is not just a matter of you know, having a great plan and stuff like that, but also really taking time to figure out how they're diverging. And one of the things you're seeing happen is, you know, I'll say it this way, we are still at the beginning of the beginning for the cloud, right? The value of the work that will be built in generative AI to create new IP and new assets for yep. companies to be able to instrument businesses in an automated way, the value of that work is a magnitude more than the existing work Absolutely. that's either on-prem and cloud. Absolutely. So the size of what needs to be built often will exceed the capital budget of any company. So as a result, 
all the cloud providers are having to make choices of where do we invest our dollars? How do we build out infrastructure? How do we build out pass layers? And they're differentiating, so that leads to the need for us to work well together. Like Microsoft and Oracle, 12 of our locations, we set up a connection between our clouds so customers yes. can go between them. Yep, absolutely. That's a choice great among chaos. Yeah, that's yeah. That's, yeah. And, and, and the thing that's interesting about the multi-cloud and super cloud conversation is you guys just mentioned it, and here at the show at VMware Explorer is, Raghu said on stage, a little nuanced point, but I'll, I'll make my, I have a dog whistle for technical terms to get me excited. I heard <laughs> multi-cloud runtime for multi runtime. That sounds like an operating environment. This is an operating environment. That's kind of like that, that super environment we see happening. So if you believe that distributed computing is here and that's what cloud is, you ask yourself, okay, what's the ecosystem like? Where does AI fit? So the, these questions start coming up. And right now, Ross kind of brought this up. I want to put out the topic is, these are enterprise challenges. That's yeah. right. Okay. Yes, yeah, cloud 1.0, okay, startups got in there, Airbnb, great stuff, SaaS is developed. Now, security. Enterprise, the old enterprise, they make complex problems more complex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in cloud, you can't do that. You got to make them simpler and you got to interoperate. So the question on the table is, their enterprise has real needs, security, performance, compliance, and AI. You put it together, you guys build it, What's that look like in your guys' mind? How does the enterprise get what they need? Because you can't falter on any one of those categories. Well, I think when you take a look at an enterprise, right, if you look at individual applications, whether you want to look at an application ready, enterprises have massive estates that are extremely complex. And they need audit ready, self-healing, secure environments that are in an AI sense, that their data is theirs. Whether they're using an existing model or whether they're building their own model or they're dealing, dealing with the cohort of publicly available data, they need to make sure they can keep that data at home and that in, that basically that intelligent at home and save it. But even across all of their applications, across multi-cloud, they need to leverage the best of each and every one of us to do what they can do best in areas that give them the best, I hate to use the term bang for their buck, yeah. but that's it. And they're going to take a look at what they have and they have a long standing partnership with VMware. They have great relationship with Kindrel. They have great relationships with Oracle. They have great relationships with Microsoft. And I think it's, yeah. it's to all of us to sit down like this and decide, okay, how can they benefit with all of this together? I don't think there ever will be one answer. Yep. And that is why the, the whole approach around ecosystem is very, very important, right? It's like a spider's web, right? You, you are yep. bringing many things together. You want to make sure that they are all interlocked. You want to make sure that they are all interoperable. And you're all, you know, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is solve a customer problem, exactly. not make it more complex for them, make it simpler for them. It's up to us as providers to build those things for our customers, to, to you know, to bring that spider's web together. It's hard to have this conversation <laughs> without pitching a solution. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much I want to say. I know that. Uh, Feel free to say it. We're, yeah. It's open mic night tonight here on this. Oh, I think we're going to we're going to all stay moment. friendly. <laughs> I think Ross's point earlier was really important that all of us are investing differently. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And as a result, interoperability is not automatic, and that's okay Very, because that divergent value in all of the technology investments we made can be put together to handle complex problems and make them simple. And to the point you made, John, in terms of making sure that the operating environment, the operating model, operations, any aspect of that continuum remains true to delivering value yep. while leveraging the investments all of you have made. Right. And that's what makes the customer's objectives real. Moving their innovation agenda while capitalizing on all the innovations all of our partners are bringing. Ross, I'd like to ask you a question. I know OCI has always been performance. I've been covering Oracle for a long time. Right. Performance, performance, security, performance. That's kind of the bread and butter of Oracle. Yeah. Okay. When you look at multi-cloud, how do you see that optimizing for you guys as you're in this multi-environment mode and still maintain that performance? Because that's going to come up a lot. Does it, it's perform and certainly with data and the edge coming. There's a slightly technical answer I won't go into on performance <laughs> that gets into non-blocking networks and layer two virtualization stuff that it really isn't, as you look at clouds grow, you end up with collisions, you end up with challenges and stuff. We tried to engineer, because we're late. We had the opportunity to look at whether people had done and said, if you were to start over, what would you do? So we see uh, you know, Azure and other folks making similar investments, but we had the blank slate, so we could just start that way, yeah. right? Um, that notion of performance is something that's very critical to our exadata platforms, our applications, and, and all those things. But 
it has to be performance at a reasonable price. And I think that's the thing customers are really looking for is, when you look across the different clouds, am I getting, to your point, the most bang for the buck? And part of that equation is, is it easy? And in many cases, that's where multi-cloud becomes really critical because you have skill sets that are in one, you have application estates that are in one, exactly. you have data that's sitting in another one. And I, I look at it this way, all of us share a piece of the wisdom our customers need. Right? We all bring to the table a piece of it. And when we collaborate and work well together, we end up delivering a greater outcome for the customer, a wiser result. And I think the pressure from customers for us to do this is higher than it ever has been. That's I mean, right. we get conversations from folks of like, yeah. why don't you play well with those guys? Well, yeah. we're open to it. Let's play yeah. well with them because <laughs> we, you know, we're a changed Oracle in the sense that we realize the opportunity in front of us is yeah. massive. And yeah. it's not about protecting a database moat or protecting these things. It's about yeah. pleasing customers at scale in a way that you can do, right? So that's, that's, a, that's, a big, that's the big point. I remember, I'm old. I remember the 80s and 90s, you know, multi-vendor. How do you do multi-vendor in the cloud when you have an operating environment, not just buying a solution, they got to work together. API, APIs were great, now you got LLMs coming in. You got to think about what needs to work together, and this is where I think you have a lot of experience on that, where things get yep. integrated or not. You have silos, like I, I will make the argument, app tiers are isolated, data needs to integrate. Yep. So you brought it up with APIs, you brought it up that's like replicating data between systems, being able to have a consistent set of records that you can, you know, immutable records you can count on and those things. That's where the interoperability comes is, can you move information between these? Because you might be running the Gen AI model that my data that's sitting from a transaction Excellent. system is going into. Okay, well it has to be able to go between, right? And that's where and, the frictions have to come And that's where the complexity lies as well, right? That's yeah. where you know you have the compliance issues, the legal issues also, because the data can be anywhere, and data is your, basically that's your... It's the asset. It's the asset. Yeah, data right? is the new oil. I do, I want to... Necessary from an operations perspective is something that requires visibility with actionable intelligence. And whether that's the bridge technology from us, the area from VMware, community is pulling together to bring this capability to our customers. Right. So that products like Bridge can give the insights and the actionable intelligence so the customers can have the confidence that app tier may be vertically isolated, the data is integrated, policy for compliance is being addressed, right. there is insight into cost, and we are actually delivering, as we had talked about very early in the conversation, bang for the buck. Yeah. Right. Exactly. One, one last huge point on that, which is the human capital. Yeah. That it's companies cute. have invested yeah. in Oracle, in Microsoft, in VMware, all of the teams that Kindrel brings to bear with their customers. Yeah. Companies just can't shift this overnight, yeah. Absolutely. right? And I mean, not without massive impact, and it's just, in today's environment, it's almost impossible to get enough people skilled in the scale, you have to leverage that the assets That is a very important point that we don't right. necessarily talk about yeah. often. We talk about technology, we don't talk about the skills. You know, there's, there's years and years of skills that have been built up in some of these technologies, and we need to be able to leverage those uh, in this multi-cloud environment. Get the return on the original investment. Exactly. Yeah. Let's just, I want to double click on this. I think this is really worth addressing because it comes into the conversation around multiple clouds working together. Yep. The people skills, if AI continues to go on a tear, as we say it's early, this gift is going to keep giving, hasn't started to be given yet, well if it's going to give more, it's going to be great. Cloud, you got VMware, you got Microsoft, you got Oracle, you got, you got people that have specialized on, on, the, on these technologies and the stacks. Yeah. Well, and now you have, okay, if automation comes in, operations and admin role, they're well understood concepts and could potentially have help with AI. The, arc, the cloud architect, to me, I think is coming, I'm hearing out of this event here, cloud architect will be the premium job. It is. It, it is. Although I you would just make sure we, we address one thing real quick, which is cloud skills are the skill. Like knowing how to build and architect the cloud solution takes a while to learn that. If you're an AWS engineer, you could become an Azure engineer like that. It's like I've been trained on Chrysler's my entire life. I understand transmissions and engines. I walk in a Ford shop, I'm going to need to learn the tooling, I'm going to need to learn the specific gauges and stuff, but the principle of the engineering is the same. So that's one of the things we're starting to see is like Kubernetes and containers, so standardized now that unless you're dealing with like a really odd way to run containers like Corey Quinn does and putting them <laughs> in Route 53 or whatever, that's a really odd way to run containers, but if you're running them in a normal way, the skills are in managed Kubernetes, the yeah. skill in managed Kubernetes. And what I start seeing happen is like, you talked about the lack of people. I have this question in my head, which is, 
how many man hours are in Terraform right now? How much automation have we already captured that intelligence and how much more will we capture yeah. in tooling and in scripting and automation and as we start building machine learning into that automation, I, I think the human capital side of this, which is by far the largest budget required, yeah. will go down. I mean, it will become, so the because we need to reinvest it in the next bow wave. Yeah. So the interesting thing is skills that are technology based, absolutely what you're saying would happen. But the knowledge about the application oh, of sure. the business. That still remains. That yeah. still remains, Absolutely. and it's not easy to harvest digitally. And that's where the role of stitching together yeah. multiple cloud architectures, defining policy, defining the operating model for operations, yeah. that becomes key. Yeah. And that's not as easy to automate. It's the data, there's a data, you bring in, it's all about data, you mentioned that. And you know, I remember the old search days, contextual and behavioral data. Right. If you have, con and the class a little bit different, I want to get you guys' reaction to this. And I've, I've been saying this on theCUBE and other interviews. It's different, it's not just behavioral, because behavior describes something. You got contextual, which is still relevant, but the data is now action. Because if automation comes in, actions are happening. Yeah, right. absolutely. So uh, it's context, and the behavior is action. Uh, or, uh, do you, do you disagree or? or I, I, I don't necessarily disagree, but when I think of things at an application level, yeah. all applications do is collect and process data. I mean, if you look at, you know, generative AI, I mean, it's at its base level, it's a natural language interface, a logic right. interface, chewing through a bunch of data in, in a way that you direct it. But to me, how we aggregate or disaggregate data or how we make it work across different platforms, this is a solution that I think AI can solve for companies and back to the human skilling, you know, the people that can start to really understand and how to drive that engine, it's huge value for businesses, it's huge value yeah. for companies. A Andrew, let me just challenge you a little bit on that part. Okay. Right? Just because of the fact, because the data is all over the place right now, right? Correct. And, and for, the la for the LLMs to work, you know, you really need to aggregate that data for it to really be not hallucinating, right? So chat GPT can hallucinate based yeah. on what data is provided to it. And that is still a big issue that has not been solved, at least. Not, I agree. Uh, you know, there's, there's data all over the There's publicly available data, there's private data. And for us to be able to use AI to really make uh, particular use cases work, we need to have that aggregation. And that's a problem that's still existing. It's a growing I, problem. It, it's, it's a bigger well, problem. The, the volume data. is the layer of policy on data. Absolutely. Absolutely. What are you are allowed what yes. purpose are you allowed to use it for? Yeah. Yeah. And, and security too, right? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and the volume of data that's being created, the amount of data created today at the edge, it, it's just coming at yeah. such a volume that we need assistance to process it and make intelligent decisions. And that's, I think, where we're going with a lot of and this. I think yeah. this enterprise, back to the enterprise question earlier, yep. real-time data is right now great because we have to take action yeah. on real-time. The historical data also now is input into decision making of real time, and the data is constantly changing, and and then and then the authenticity of the data, the trust of the data comes in. So the question is, on the table is, we see software supply chain, S bombs and whatnot. What about data supply chain? Oh, absolutely. I so, mean, that's going to be an issue. I want to point out something. You guys are talking about loud, large language models and sort of interpreting data that's like document data and unstructured and things like that. You know, there are, there are companies that are building right now AI engines that are transformers that are different in the sense that they're API aware and they're SDK aware. They know how systems work. And I'll just ask this question. If you want to understand a company's strategy, go look at their ERP system and the policies that are in the ERP. Yep. Their Absolutely. entire strategy is outlined. All their workflows on <laughs> it, how It's people, like DNA. You could, yeah. in, you could take a <laughs> exactly. fingerprint of a company and say, how conservative are they based on the yeah. approval policies on expenses, approval policies on POs? So there's an induced information and then there's direct information. That induced information on the systems we built over time, that's going to be transformative because when you pair that with something that can automatically access APIs and build code, you start getting goal-oriented software systems. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's almost like manufactured data, then the risk of the outcome being on target increases. Yeah, Not absolutely. that you can't manage it, but that just increases the complexity ever more. So are we going to have a creative class in technology? Yeah. Because that, that's where it's going. Yeah, it is. If, you're, it is. if you going see what you're happening, on an automated tasks are done, the creativity, just what you hear in all the themes, Do you what know, does that look like? Look, look, what does the creative class here. look like? Just imagine, if you, if you buy a copy of Photoshop, it'll show you every developer who worked on Photoshop. It was a tremendous piece of engineering to create that. 
and it's exclusively used by artists now. So you say, is there going to be a creative class with technology? I would argue that's the end game for almost all technologies. Yeah, that's awesome. Just to enable a what does it look class. like? Yeah. What does that look like? What does the creative class look like? What? Are they magically Harry Potter-like? No, they're, 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 the they're, they're more thinking about if I can envision a new business model and I could get coached from an AI on where the gaps in strategy are that I need to tune up. If I could propose a goal and a set of strategies to it, could it map the system to achieve those strategies? That's what Good I mean point, by yeah. creative. Yeah, it's awesome. Or yeah. can it find efficiencies? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? And I, I mean, I think of things like call centers, right? Where in, in modern call centers, somebody has a very frustrating experience trying to navigate. Now, AI can take a look at that customer, that customer history, and maybe have a, a somewhat of a logical reason for the call and help direct them to the right person and also prompt the person that they're speaking to with a direction. So it can be a real top-down integration. It, I, I think it's yeah. very I mean, the valuable. use cases are just, there's yep. so many use yep. cases, right? Predictive maintenance, uh, manufacturing, automotive. You just take, take it. There's so many use cases where you can use it right now. Um, and, 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 and create so much efficiencies. That the Neil, you're, you're talking about, go ahead. Yeah, the most interesting creativity I'm seeing right now is in multi-cloud architectures. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not to bring it home, but multi-cloud architectures create an opportunity yeah. for an organization to really capture to your earlier point about, you know, what are their policies, right. what is it, just but, define it in yeah. the system. And that's why I think cloud architecture is a systems thinking. We hear design thinking. I think we're entering an era of system thinking creativity yep. and personalization. Because what you just said, your example was yeah. personalization. Or no, we yeah. trust it. Ma map me out my goals, like, so go. There, there's been a massive change in cloud developments, and this is true in every cloud, this is not anything particular. But I think it's been missed, uh, and it's, I think, important to put up, which is if you look at a private data center like companies, things are done in layers. You have a five-year network refresh where you yeah. do your network architecture, you have a storage refresh. In the cloud, every application can be its own silo of services, it can yeah. be unique. So as a result, the creativity that goes into what do I need for this workload can be vastly different than what you're building in the next work in the workload. So that enables a whole new set of developer creativity in the cloud that you're not locked into one architecture of the network. Yeah. What I we think are that finding, also shifts the way people work you know, in terms of my job, right? In, in that example, what we are finding is more customers than ever are adopting a product mindset. And the creativity is not just in the developers and with the application of the database, but the creativity is in the entire stack, full process, yep. yeah. from oh, the yeah. business process down to which All clouds, to which data, what wow. analytics. The My final question to put on the table, and we'll go around for closing summary from each of you if you don't mind. Um, but the final question is, we obviously love generative AI. We got generative BI coming next probably. All this is going on. You got the dorm room to the to the dorm from the boardroom to the dorm room activity. Yep. C suite. Take that hill. I need AI and everything. Okay. Now you got to implement it. Then you got innovation coming out of that. But you got compliance, legal issues. So kind of some stall there. I won't say it's going to be a blocker forever. But if you go look at the, the bottoms up at the, the in the dorm room, the, the the entrepreneurial activity, the developers, it's off the charts. Yeah. They're intoxicated I, with this stuff. They're exploding with creativity. And so the question is, how do you meet it in the middle? What happens next? What's going to be the the? How do you make this? How do we not lose momentum? Yeah. Between keeping the C-suite excited and confident. Okay, and the I don't, I don't think there's any coding. danger of losing momentum. <laughs> exactly. I think that train left okay, the station who, a long who, time who ago. Gets, who gets to the finish line first? Bottoms up or? Well, I don't down? know if there's a finish I'll, line. Yeah, yeah, I don't. It's, or, it's a journey, as I what I what I hear. I like that you think we're going to get to an end at some point. Yeah, no, <laughs> this is the middle somewhere, I so, guess. I, I do want to point out, like one of my favorite things on Reddit is the subreddit side project. And reason being is that's developers, guys who have a day job working at a tech company who go and say, I had this idea, bug me at night, I want to go build something hammered it out. And what you're seeing is the quality of those side projects from three years ago was a roughly compiled Python app mm -hmm. to now it's a full SaaS experience delivered on a cloud in five hours. Like they go in and build them. And so what I see these in the dorm rooms doing is they're creating new, uh, and I'll use a branded term, new Lego blocks of innovation that you can take and build on. They're not monolithic systems, they're components. And I, I look at this wave of creativity coming on and, and watch this in the marketing tools area. Yeah. It's like there's a thousand little marketing The tools. productivity is off the charts. Yeah, but a thousand of them. But they all plug into HubSpot or Salesforce yeah. or yeah. Sales Cloud or Dynamics or whatever. They all hook in together. They're all built for yeah. integration. I think that's one of the dominant things in kind of the way we develop now is people building services on a cloud, build it with the intent, it's going to connect to a lot of things as yeah. opposed to be a silo. 
Yep. Awesome. awesome. I agree. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add one more thing to it, which is you know what Raghu talked about in his keynote today around the private AI, right? And I think it's a very, you know, what you talked about in the dorm room is very relevant. When you talk about enterprise customers, though, that's when your private AI piece will be a very, very oh, relevant. For sure, for sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And absolutely. And I think that's where, that's the platform piece that, you know, with VMware and the rest of its ecosystem yeah. that's, that's being provided. And to build on top of that, the partners like Kindrel who can actually bring all of these things together uh, with different cloud providers as well is going to be key to success the for solutions us. solutions for the C-suite. Yeah. Absolutely, as well as the dome room. Yeah. The yeah. risk of compliance and yeah. the fear of yeah. theft is going up. So in as much as we see a lot of creativity and the solutions that hook up into all these places and the yeah. data is transferring where you didn't expect it. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. I mean, I love that earlier point about apps being up here and then this the development of the data that's yeah. critical. And yeah. we even coined the term the data developer because we think a new class is going to be coming out of this, this, this trend, Absolutely. which is coding data. Um, and we got platform engineering's booming. And so, you know, I love that fact that we got rid of the SRE word because that was more of a Google thing, but I think platform engineering is now is like the version of SRE, but mm -hmm. for enterprises. Yep, yep. Um, so you got platform engineering becoming much more robust from a skill set. You got AI and these data developers, the apps are just going to fall into place. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to go back to your earlier comment just for my final thought or kind of finishing thought, but top down or bottoms up? The answer, I think, is both. Right, there's people right now that I think are developing things that can be leveraged at the enterprise level and, and definitely an enterprise might take that as, a, as, a, as basically a private model and say someone has really come out with a way to do something really transformative leveraging a lot of technologies and because of AI, it, it literally will scale. Yeah. And open source allows people to contribute really fast yep. and they could be in a dorm room or in a side hustle or whatever, okay. That doesn't qualify as a final comment. Oh, okay, good. I'll give you a mulligan. <laughs> well, you said, you said two minutes. Since technically, we're going to go around the horn. Ross, we'll start with you. We'll go around the horn. We'll end with Sunil Control. So I, final I think, statement. I think one of the things I, it's really one of the phrases we use at Oracle is clouds are built, not bought. And one of the things I like to celebrate is the rise of the builder, whether it's in the dorm room or enterprise. You, you see people now building systems with the design that it's it's really meant to be integrated. It's meant to have APIs. An API first development model has taken hold. That's so much better than the old ways we used to do stuff where closed, my app is an island, nothing connects to it. <laughs> I just think we're on the verge of unlocking a significant amount of intellectual property that's been locked up in yeah. ways that we can't conceive yet. Yeah. Awesome. I, I, I think for us, we're really, if we focus on our goals, empowering every person at every organization to do more, and that's do more with all of us collectively and leverage their history, their history, level the investments that they've made up to where AI can build on what they've created and really go forward. So it's, it's an extremely exciting time for, for all of us. Thank you. You know, we're in that fourth stage again. The first stage, you know, the PC stage, then we had got to the web stage, then we got to the mobile stage. Now we're at the AI stage. We're just at the beginning of AI stage. It is yeah. extremely important to work for, for us to work as an ecosystem to build what's necessary to come to an agreement, you know, because we're, we're going to be, you know, having different technologies. Yep. We need to be coming to an agreement and we need to have policy and compliance and security all baked into it because that's the only thing that'll take us to the next step of, Absolutely. you know, delivering customer success. Right. So Neil, take us home. You have to pull it all together for customers at Kindrel. Take Kindrel, us home. security, yeah. take it home, yeah. So the technology and the, te the technologist in me is very excited about all the things you talked about and how every developer is more empowered, every business user is more empowered to produce, build applications, yeah. get access to data, come to insights. The challenge for a large enterprise is to ensure this is done in a risk-managed manner. Of course. Yeah. And that which works scales yeah. operationally and from a performance perspective, cost managed as we discussed earlier, and pulling it all to that complexity together is a very exciting challenge and it's wonderful to have partners who are investing in helping it make it easier for the customers to achieve that. And multi-cloud is the best example of this, but really these technologies are everywhere, but multi-cloud is really pulling it together and I'm really excited for this time of the industry on what we can do for our customers. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, thank you so much. We actually 
packed a lot of data in that <laughs> yeah, interview. Absolutely. When we got put that through our generative AI algorithm, <laughs> I think we're going to have some highlights out of that. Right. That's awesome. I hope so. Ross, yeah. Andrew, Monty, Sunil, thank you so much for sharing uh, your perspective on this modernization, multi-cloud, super cloud world. Really appreciate it thank coming you. on theCUBE. Thank you very much. Right. I'm John Furrier. That's a wrap for day one on this set. We're going to do an analyst wrap up on the other set over there. You're watching the live CUBE coverage. Go to siliconangle.com for all the action. That's where the traffic is. Cube.net where all the videos are and our community. Signing off here with this historic panel at VMware Explorer.